because you cannot divide Jesus from Mary, either doctrinally or historically or liturgically. It's fitting that one day after celebrating the wonderful solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, today we celebrate the beautiful feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Devotion to the Immaculate Heart is rooted in the beginning. You see it in the scriptures and in the fathers of the church in seed form. The seed then begins to sprout around the 12th century. The tree begins to flower in the 17th century. And the fruits from this devotion are being produced here and now in our times. So let's take a brief look at these four phases of development in devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In the Gospel of Luke, St. Luke, the beloved physician, twice mentions the heart of Mary. He presents her to us as if it were, uh, her heart to us as if it were a golden jewel case in which all the words and actions of Jesus are gathered and stored. The evangelist writes in Luke 2, verse 19, that, quote, Mary kept all these things about Jesus, pondering on them in her heart. And at the end of the same chapter, we hear him say again, his mother kept all these things in her heart. Luke 2, verse 51. That's how we ended today's gospel. So the gospel of Jesus Christ first found a home in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It was first written down in her heart before it was ever preached, before it ever took words to paper. In the eighth century, St. John Damascene, when reading the Old Testament book of Daniel, he saw a symbol of the heart of Our Lady there, and of all places in the fiery furnace that you find in that book, a furnace which was heated seven times hotter than normal, and into which were thrown Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, but they were unharmed by that fire. They danced around, for those of you who know the story, they danced around and they sang to God in that fire without being consumed. John Damascene writes this, he says, quote, and are not you, Mary, represented by that fiery furnace? And is not the ardent and at the same time cooling fire, is it not perhaps the image of the love that blazes from your ardent heart, says St. John Damascene. So the fire from the furnace which burned and consumed those who didn't love God, but was a source of joy and rejoicing for those who did love him, that fire and that furnace are just like the heart of Our Lady, who is the source of rejoicing for the children that love her. If we move from there to about the 12th century, we find at that time two writings ascribed to St. Bernard of Clairvaux, they probably weren't written by him, but they're ascribed to him, in which there is an explicit invocation of the heart of Mary. And in the French theologian Richard of saint Loren, he, in the 13th century, is the first really to talk about the merits of Our Lady's heart. He wrote a work called De Laudibus Beate Maria Virginis in praise of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in that book, he says this, he says, one, that the heart of Mary was the source and origin of our salvation. Two, that of all hearts, hers was the most worthy to receive the Son of God, who descended from the bosom of the Father into our world. Three, he said that in her heart, justice and mercy extend the sign of peace to each other. He says that, just like we do during the, sign, during the Mass. Uh, justice and mercy extend the sign of peace, a very beautiful image that he gives of the heart of Our Lady in her heart. For that the heart of Mary bore the same wounds in it that the body of Jesus bore in him. So in her heart, she carried the same wounds that Jesus had in his body. Five, that Mary's heart is the ark and the treasure of the divine scriptures, and that her heart, he said, is a walking library of the Old and New Testaments. So. Mary's heart is essentially a living library of all the scriptures, he says. And six, finally, that her heart is a book of life upon which the life of Jesus was written with golden letters by the finger of God. Very beautiful image there, meaning that the whole life of Christ was again first written in the heart of Our Lady by the Holy Spirit himself. Very beautiful reflection from Richard of saint Loren. In that same century, the 13th century, both St. Mactilde and St. Gertrude had a special devotion to the heart of Mary. St. Mactilde, who's from Germany, 
She wrote a book called The Book of Special Grace, and in that she says that it was Jesus himself who taught her to honor the heart of Our Lady, since her heart was, as she said, the purest, most humble, most devout, most fervent, most diligent, most patient, and most faithful of all hearts. St. Gertrude the Great, in her book, The Herald of Divine Love, she says this, she says that once on the feast of the Annunciation, she was in choir and she was singing the Ave Maria during the liturgy, and at that time she had a vision. She said she saw three streams like water coming forth from the Father, from the Son, and from the Holy Spirit. And she said the streams impulsively rushed into the heart of Mary and then they returned to God with the same force, with the same impulsivity, with the same impetuosity. St. Gertrude interpreted that vision to mean that the Holy Trinity had made of Mary the most powerful person after God the Father, the wisest person after God the Son, and the most benevolent person after God the Holy Spirit. As a side note, usually when we are impetuous or impulsive about something, that's not always the best thing. A lot of times we have to calm down with our impetuosity and our impulsivity, but when God is impetuous or impulsive about something, we need to pay attention to that. If he is impetuous about showing, showering graces and blessings upon Our Lady, that should help us realize that she really is a tremendous treasure. What a tremendous treasure she must be. St. Bridget of Sweden, in her own writings, said that there is a moral identity between the hearts of Jesus and Mary. So their two hearts are not only similar, but they're morally identical because of the unique affection and understanding that bound them together. Our Lord said to St. Bridget, he said this, the heart of my mother was like my heart. For this reason, I can say that my mother and I perform the work of the salvation of humanity, almost as if we had one heart. I did it, I did it, he says, through the sufferings I supported in my body and in my heart. She did it through the love and the sufferings of her, her heart, said our Lord to St. Bridget. And Our Lady herself said to St. Bridget, she said, quote, know for certain that I loved my son so ardently and he loved me in return so tenderly that we were like one single heart, said Our Lady. And then she says to St. Bridget, I dare to say that this, his suffering was my suffering because his heart was my heart. Just as Adam and Eve sold the world to the devil for a piece of fruit, so too my beloved son willed that I cooperate with him in order to redeem it, almost as if we had but one heart between us. Very beautiful reflection from St. Bridget, Our Lady's words to her. In the 15th century, the honor and devotion given to the Immaculate Heart of Mary became more intense and it increased with people like Jean Gerson, with people like St. Lawrence Justinian, and especially with the Franciscan St. Bernardine of Siena, all of them praising the Heart of Mary with words and images and comparisons full of faith and full of love as well. And even in the midst of the century of revolution, the 16th century, even in the midst of that tragedy, church leaders like St. Francis de Sales, St. Peter Canisius, Cardinal de Berlue, I think that's how you pronounce it, probably not, Louis of Granada as well, they all continued to praise the heart of our beloved queen. In the midst of the 17th century, devotion to Our Lady's heart really became more widespread among God's people, and this is thanks the work of St. John Eudes. In French, I believe they say Eud, that's how they pronounce his name. Pope St. Pius X called him the father, the doctor, and the apostle of the liturgy of the devotion of the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. In about 1643, he and his religious brothers began celebrating the liturgical feast of Our Lady's Sacred Heart. It was actually 20 years before the Sacred Heart of Jesus was celebrated, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. So first Our Lady and then Our Lord, even liturgically speaking in this case. And the Feast of the Heart of Mary was celebrated publicly five years later in 1648 with a mass and office composed by St. John Eudes. Pius XII extended this feast 
to the whole church the last century, and that's why we're celebrating it. That's why we have the blessing of celebrating it today. St. John Eudes also wrote a book entitled The Admirable Heart of the Most Holy Mother of God, in which he finished that work just a few weeks before he died. And in there, he says that with Our Lady's heart, we venerate and honor not only her physical heart, but especially and above all, he says we honor her spiritual heart, meaning that we honor the greatness and the purity of who she is as a person. And he said that the person of Mary is best expressed by one word, by one reality, by the reality of love. The person of Our Lady is best expressed by the word love, he says. And the heart of Mary is the beating symbol of that love, says St. John Eudes. So the physical heart of Mary is the door by which we enter into her spiritual heart and contemplate that spiritual heart. From this devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, uh, there has arisen in our time a number of religious congregations and institutes which have in their names Immaculate Heart of Mary and also there have been in the last 200 years or so confraternities and groups dedicated to honoring and spreading devotion to the heart of our Blessed Mother, even our Franciscans of the Immaculate, even our MIM. It's our mission is to spreading devotion and consecration to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. We know that she said at Fatima, she said to the three children, two of whom are saints, one of whom is on the way to becoming a saint, she said to them that God wishes to establish devotion to her Immaculate Heart for the salvation of sinners, she said. Mary is our refuge from God's divine justice. Both Pope Pius XII and Pope St. John Paul II have consecrated humanity and the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary because, to borrow from Our Lady's words at Fatima, because only she can help us at this time. When you reject the fatherhood of God, as our Western culture has done, and when you reject faith in Jesus Christ, as countless people have done in the 20th century and the 21st century as well, then all you have left is the mother. She really is our last hope in that sense, the mother of God. If the root of all sin lies in the heart of man, as the Catechism says in number 1873, then the root of all grace and salvation lies in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So today let's ask Our Lady for the grace to love her Immaculate Heart all the more, and also let's ask her for the grace to truly love the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In loving those two hearts, our own hearts will become more like them, and that'll be a blessing for us and for everyone else as well. Praise be Jesus and Mary.